Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the way that you bless and for the way you draw people unto yourself and grant them life. And Lord, now we pray that you would be honored through the preaching of your word. Lord, help us to receive the word of God today as the word of God and not as the word of man. I pray that our minds would be attentive, that our ears would listen, and our hearts would be receptive. And God, that we would leave here ready and eager to obey the truth that we have learned. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to Romans. Romans chapter 11. Now, I will say this. Starting next Sunday, we will be back in our series through 1 Thessalonians. All right? We've taken a break as we've dealt with this baptism series. And as I've been praying through, I've been thinking, how in the world do I end this series? Well, one of the ways you've already experienced was through our baptism celebration. But this morning, I'm going to be preaching from a very, very... Uh, lofty passage of scripture and so if you'll look there at Romans chapter 11 I know that your bulletin says verse 36 and that'll probably be what's on the screen but I actually want to back up and look at verse 33 leading up to verse 36 what we have here is a doxology a praise to God an exuberant, exuberant praise, a wonderful praise, an exalted praise given to the Lord. And it says this, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments, how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. There's a word that some of you may like. It's the word marinate. I know I like that word. Because often when I think about the word marinate, I'm thinking about it in the context of a steak. Now, for those of you who are super fit and perhaps you're a bodybuilder, then you don't like the word marinate because you've got to eat everything without anything on it, right? Just raw. I mean, you can cook it, but you don't want any, anything else. But as I look across this room, that doesn't just look like that describes very many of us, all right? So we, we all would say that we love the word marinate. I love to let a steak set. And marinate, or even if you're going if you're going to eat chicken, just to put the chicken in some marinate and let it just set for a while, perhaps a day or two, and then cook the chicken and let all that all those juices absorb within the meat. You know what I'm talking about, huh? That's good stuff, isn't it? Well, this morning I want to encourage us to marinate in the majesty of God. Just sit. And let's just soak it in. This passage that we come to today, as I've already said, is known as a doxology. An end praise. Paul's been thinking, he's been writing, he's been contemplating. And everything that he's been thinking and writing and contemplating eventually just gives forth to this doxology, this exuberant praise unto God. Now, it is beyond question, I believe... That this passage of Scripture is one of the most glorious passages in all the Bible. And I could list you many scholars who would support that view. However, we must ask the question, what led to this wonderful doxology? What led to this verse 36? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever what was Paul thinking about what led to this statement well primarily there's two views 
One view says that Paul was reflecting upon what he wrote in chapter 11. So the context of verse 36 would be chapter 11. So what does chapter 11 in the book of Romans deal with? Well, it deals with God's great sovereignty over both Jew and Gentiles. Now that word sovereignty, let me explain that just for a moment. Often you've heard the... You've heard the expression that if a country has a king, they would often say that he is the sovereign king over that nation. To say that a king is sovereign is to say that no one has the right to rule but him. And as king, he has all authority and all power to do what he wants. So when we talk about King Jesus being Sovereign. When we talk about God being sovereign, we're saying that no one rules the universe but Him. He is all-powerful and all-wise, and there, there is no one who can thwart His purposes. He alone is sovereign. And so in chapter 11, Paul is expressing that view that God is sovereign over the nation of Israel. Even in their unbelief, God is still sovereign even in the midst of their unbelief. But not only is God sovereign over the nation of Israel, God is sovereign over the Gentiles. Thus God is sovereign over all nations, peoples, tribes, tongues, and Languages, And so some people believe that when Paul begins to contemplate that very truth, that his heart overflows with, for, for, from him and through him and to him or all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. And I believe that to be true. But the other view is, is that Paul is contemplating everything up to this point that he has written in the book of Romans as a whole. I believe both are true. I believe that when Paul contemplates everything that he's written in the book of Romans, as a matter of fact, the beautiful doctrines of our faith are expressed in the book of Romans. And I believe that when Paul contemplates everything that he's written, everything that God has inspired, including chapter 11, he gives forth with this, or I should say he bursts forth with this wonderful doxology of praise. So now, here's how I expect this message to go. If we are going to have, have the same exuberant praise as that of the Apostle Paul, we need to be reminded of the doctrines that are taught in the book of Romans. And so starting there in chapter 1, we're going to take a journey through each chapter. And I'm going to discuss briefly the beautiful doctrines that are found in the book of Romans. Now, we'll end by culminating with verse 36. But here's what I want to say to you at the very beginning. There is the opportunity for you to have great blessing today. I mean... You can be blessed beyond measure. You can have peace such as perhaps you've never known or haven't had in a long time. You can have a confidence in God today that is beyond your understanding. But you've got to be willing to take the journey with me. You've got to be willing to practice discipline and stay engaged. And not allow your mind to wander off. Or to pick up your phone and scroll through your Facebook or draw mustaches on the preacher's face on the back of your bulletin. And I have found those laying around. <laughs> but what we are going to need you to do is to stay engaged so that you can receive a blessing today. As we back up to Romans chapter 1, the first doctrine that really we come in contact with is this idea of man's depravity. That mankind as a whole, without Christ, that's including you and me. Mankind as a whole, without Christ, without our salvation, we are absolutely, completely depraved. As a matter of fact, 
In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So the Bible tells us that not only are we all depraved, but as a result of our depravity, God has holy indignation. So we've just learned two doctrines. That mankind without Christ is depraved in sin. And as a result of that, God has holy indignation towards them. God has holy anger. God has wrath. For the verse says, for the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. So we see the doctrine of depravity and we see the doctrine of God's holy indignation, God's wrath. But he goes on to say, if you look at verse 29 of that same chapter, to make sure that we understand that he's including us all in this depravity, he says in verse 29 of chapter 1, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for that those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women who were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Now see, we would automatically say, well, that's talking about homosexuality. That's talking about lesbianism. Well, let's just make sure that we're all included. So let's go further. Let's read. In verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. They were evil, they were covetousness, they were malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malicious. They are gossip, slanders, haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Just covered all of us, didn't he? He just covered everyone. And in this passage of scripture, he is telling the human race that without Christ, we are all in depravity. And as a result, we are under the holy indignation of God. We are under the wrath of God because God himself is holy and God hates sin. But then he goes on to say in chapter 2 verse 2, He says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Now we look at this and we would have to conclude that in some degree or another, we've all practiced these lists of sins, these catalog of sins that Paul has listed. So therefore, as a result of these sins that we've committed against the holy God, we are under God's judgment and rightly so. So... The first doctrines that we learn there are of man's depravity and God's righteous indignation. And still, if you don't understand your depravity without Christ, let's move on to chapter 3. And you'll look at there at verse 10. And it says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. You say, well, I'm not a bad person. I don't do a lot of bad things. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm pretty good. Listen, without Christ, there's none righteous. Without Christ, there's none good. None. We are all depraved and under the righteous indignation of a holy God. And rightly so. So, think about that. You say, well, man, that doesn't cause me to burst forth with exuberant, exuberant praise. Well, we're not done. But in order for us to truly appreciate what God has done in our lives through Christ, we, most, we first need to understand what God has done. <laughs> and we can't understand what God has done unless we first understand who we are without Jesus. And so far we've learned just out of the word of God that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we've learned about depravity and we've learned about God's holy indignation God's wrath and then we move on to there and we make our way to chapter 3 verse 21 and here we are introduced to another doctrine God's righteousness or righteousness 
He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. In other words, you can't work for your salvation. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to this, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all who what? For all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Listen to this word coming up. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. That is to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He passed over former sins and it was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let me make it simple. He says, listen, yes, we are depraved. God has holy wrath. But listen, God is also righteous. And listen, this is what blows my mind. And by faith, By grace through faith in Jesus, you are made righteous. See, now you're beginning to understand the glory of these doctrines. And you're made righteous not through your good deeds. You're made righteous as a result of God's grace. Think about it. The moment you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. But you see, he also mentions another doctrine in that verse. He mentions that awkward word, perhaps, that we don't hear very much. It's the word propitiation. That word simply means to satisfy. The only reason we are able to be righteous is because Jesus Christ satisfied God's wrath upon the cross. You see, we deserve wrath. Why? Because we are depraved. But Jesus Christ went to the cross and satisfied God's wrath, propitiation, by suffering the penalty of our sin. And now by grace through faith in Christ alone, you are made righteous. And so, he says in chapter 4 verse 5 as well, And to the one who does not work, in other words, if you realize you can't work for salvation, but the one who does not work but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as what? Your faith in Christ alone is counted as righteousness. Verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness, God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. How is it that God would not count your sin against you? Because Christ suffered the wrath of God on your behalf. And now by grace through faith in Christ you are made righteous. The second beautiful, or let me just say this is the fourth, fifth beautiful doctrine that we come in contact with is justification. Justification. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through Him we also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of glory. So now he tells us what? You're justified. That word justified is a legal term. In other words, you have been declared not guilty. Even though you are guilty, you've been declared not guilty. You say, how so? Because Jesus is your propitiation. He died and suffered the penalty that you deserve. So when you just, when you trust in Christ... You are made righteous, and therefore, you are declared not guilty. So, think about, we've dealt with depravity. We've dealt with God's holy indignation, His wrath. We've dealt with God's righteousness. We've dealt with God's propitiation. We've dealt with God's justification. And now we deal with God's sanctification. Here's the cool thing. Not only are we made righteous, not only are we justified, 
but we are sanctified. That word sanctified means set apart. It means that God is conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. God didn't save you and just leave you to yourself. God saved you and now he is transforming you. God is changing you into the image of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. God is sanctifying you. You, if you are genuinely saved, you are walking in the newness of life. You are being conformed into the image of Christ. And this is a work of God's grace. He says in chapter 6, verse 20, uh, 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought forth from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. Before it did, but sin will have no dominion over you. Why? Because you are being sanctified since you are not under law, but under grace. So the sanctification of God. God saved you. He delivered you from the bondage of sin. He delivered you from the penalty of sin. And as you walk with Him, He is delivering, delivering you from the power of sin. And then ultimately, one day in glory, you will be ultimately saved from even the presence of sin. And the next beautiful doctrine that we come to, we come to chapter 8. You also see sanctification in chapter 7, verse 6. But let's move on to chapter 8. And here we come in contact with that beautiful doctrine of glorification. Glorification. That means one day you're going to be made perfect. Do you know that if you're a Christian? That one day you're going to receive a heavenly body. A perfect body. A perfect body. An eternal body. Which will never perish. Which will never get sick. An imperishable body. Now how is that so? Look at what he says in chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So if you're you're in Christ... You're no longer under the the wrath of God. Why? Because you've been made righteous. You've been justified. You're being sanctified. So you're no longer under the wrath of God. Now we say, how is this so? Not because of anything that you've done, but, but because of what God has done. Look at what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. This is God's perspective of your salvation. God says you're saved because of these glorious truths here. Look at what he says. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also what? Glorified. So there is a beautiful day of glorification that is coming. Now, if we follow how this doctrine has played itself out, these beautiful doctrines, think about it for a moment. We came in contact, first of all, are you with me? We came in contact, first of all, with the depravity of man. And and as a result of that, God's holy, righteous indignation. And then the very next thing that we come in contact with is God's righteousness. God's righteousness was satisfied when he sent his son to die upon the cross for you. Thus, God the Father satisfied his own wrath. And now as a result of that, we can be made righteous. And when we are made righteous, we are declared not guilty. And he sanctifies us. He transforms us into the image of his son. And one day, all this is going to give forth to what? Glorification. You're going to be made perfect. 
It's a chain that cannot be broken because those whom he predestined, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justifies, he what? He glorifies. Paul speaks of it in the past tense because it's as good as done. He says, you're glorified. Even though you're not yet, he speaks of it in the past tense because when God says it, he will fulfill it. So we come in contact with glorification. And then the next thing that we come in contact with is the beautiful doctrine of preservation. God preserves his children. Look at what he says in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else. In other words, if I left something else, left something out, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those whom God makes righteous, those whom God justifies, those whom God is sanctifying, those whom God promises glorification are being preserved by the powerful, omnipotent hand, omnipotent hand of a sovereign king of glory. And now we get to this beautiful doc doctrine that's often debated. But this morning we did not come for debate. We came to marinate. Amen? We're just going to marinate. We're just going to let the scripture speak for itself. That's all I want you to do. I just want you to soak it in this morning. See, because we come to that beautiful, wonderful doctrine of election in chapter 9. And we see that, look at chapter 9, verse 6. He's thinking about how the nation of Israel has, as a whole has turned its back on God. As a whole, the nation of Israel has forgotten God. But he says, it's not as though the word of God has failed. In other words, the nation of Israel, they're God's chosen people and they've rejected Christ. But it's not like the word of God has failed. As a matter of fact, God's going to tell us it's a part of his plan. Look at what he says. For not all, last part of verse 6, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Just because you're an Israelite by birth doesn't mean you're one of God's chosen Israelites. I'm just reading the Bible. Verse 7. And not all children of Abraham, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Wait a minute. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. But the, the promise of the covenant did not come through Ishmael. So what did God do? God chose Isaac over Ishmael. You say, well, that was only because Ishmael was born of a Gentile Hagar. And so, of course, okay, well, let's, let's follow that argument even further. So, verse 7, Now all the children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And Paul anticipates that people will have that argument that I just brought up. So, verse 8, This means that not all children of the flesh who are, the children of, are children of God, but the children of promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year I will return, and Sarah, Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah has conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, our forefather Isaac. Okay, so he says, you don't believe in the Hagar incident. Well, then let me use Rebekah as an example. Because Rebekah had two boys of the same man, Isaac. Right? Verse 11. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. So for the purpose of God's election, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Simply, listen. He says, Rebekah had two sons, 
Isaac, I mean Jacob and Esau. And culture says that Esau should have received the blessing because he's the older. But so that the world will know that God is sovereign and that God elects whomever he will, God chose Jacob over Esau. Not because of anything that they had done, simply because God chose to do so. Just marinate for a moment. You want to believe in a God like that, by the way. Because if you don't believe in a God like that, then that means he's not sovereign. And my goodness, what are you going to do in the midst of these chaotic events in our world? If God's not in control, then boy, we're in trouble. He's in control of everything. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice with God? You may be thinking, well, how can that be so? Don't you love the way that Paul anticipates all these arguments? He says, is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. He's sovereign in his election. Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault then? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded molded, say to the molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another vessel for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much, much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So we see the reality that God, and this is not a sermon on election. We're just identifying one of the beautiful doctrines taught in the book of Romans. And the fact that God is sovereign. In his election. You are saved today, if indeed you are, because God chose you to be saved. Marinate in that, dear friend. Absorb all you can. And if you embrace it with a humble heart, you indeed will burst forth with exalted doxology. We move on from there, and in chapter 10, we see the compassion of God's heart. Is he, he desires for the nations to be saved. And that's the beautiful thing about the infinite wisdom of God. God desires for everyone to be saved. He desires for everyone to be saved. But at the same time, we have to say that according to God's word, those of us who are saved, we are saved because God's election. But then we come to chapter 10 and he says, listen, don't lose sight of the fact that God desires, God has a heart for the nations. Chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, the Lord has, for the Lord who has believed, for Lord who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so therefore we see the, the missionary heart of God for the nations. The compassionate heart of God for every tribe, tongue, and language to worship him. And then we end up where we first began in chapter 11. And in chapter 11 we see the wisdom of God. 
And now it begins to all make sense. Why did the nation of Israel as a whole reject the Messiah? Why? So that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. And this was not plan B. This is plan A from before time and eternity ever was. It's all a part of God's sovereign purpose. And as Paul contemplates the righteousness of God, and as Paul contempl- or let me back up, as Paul contemplates the depravity of man and the holy indignation of God, and as he contemplates the righteousness of God and the propitiation of God and the imputation of our sin upon Christ and his righteousness upon us, and as he contemplates justification and sanctification and glorification and God's election and God's sovereignty and God's preservation and God's wisdom and God's compassion for the nations as he begins to contemplate all these things and as he begins to marinate and and meditate upon these doctrinal truths Paul says all the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord who has been his counselor who has given him a gift that he might repay no one God is all wise God is all sufficient God alone is sovereign and for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever amen oh we get so hung up in questioning why God does what he does we get so hung up in arguments that we forget to marinate And the majesty and the sovereignty of a holy, righteous God. Our view of God must be elevated. That is the problem of our world today. Is that God has been brought down low. And I say once again at this church, we are going to seek to have a high view of God. And I hope every day when I stand in this pulpit that we would see the Lord lofty and exalted in the train of His robe filling the temple. Just in that last verse, verse 36, notice the prepositions. For from him, through him, and to him. The prepositions being from, through, to. What do we learn from these prepositions? Number one, we learn that the fact that all things are from God means that he's the source of all things. All these beautiful doctrines that I just addressed... God is the source of them all. All these doctrines are true because God created them. But not only is God the source of the gospel, not only is God the source of these beautiful, rich truths, God is the source of the universe. And He upholds all things with His sovereign hand. All things are from Him. He's the source of all things. All things are through Him. What does that mean? That means He's the means of all things. Not only did He create all things, but He sustains them. This galaxy, which there are suspected to be millions of galaxies, if not billions. I can't remember, but I know there's a lot. But in our own galaxy, which contains our solar system, and in that solar system, there's a small planet called Earth. And do you know that the the majority of our solar system is made up of the sun? 
the sun. And the sun is but a medium-sized star. A medium-sized star. And just in our own galaxy, including there, the Milky Way, and within our solar system, there's this little planet called Earth. And within that little planet, there are nations. And within those nations, there are people. And not just solar systems and not just galaxies, but the totality of the universe is sustained by God. Not only did He create these doctrines, He is the one who moves these doctrines. He sustains these doctrines as He sustains the universe. And then lastly... All things are to Him. That means that God is the end of all things. All things that exist. All these beautiful doctrines that we've talked about. And the universe as a whole. All things exist to the end of God's glory. That word glory. The word doxa in the Greek literally means the heaviness of God. The weight of God. All things exist to declare the heaviness of God. God! That means that's why you exist. So as we look at this message in conclusion, we ask these three questions. Who is to be glorified? God is. Why should God be glorified? Because of these beautiful truths that we've already discussed this morning. And then lastly, how is God to be glorified? How is God to be glorified? Let us not forget chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might be able to discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The only way to respond to such beautiful truth is to offer yourself back to the Lord, not only in exalted doxology, but to offer yourself back to the Lord in humble submission. We were radically corrupted, but sovereignly purified. Radically enslaved, but sovereignly emancipated. Radically unable, but sovereignly empowered. And the truth of God's sovereignty is the source of peace and confidence no matter what we go through in life. I ask you this morning to bow your heads. For our musicians to come, for our pastors to make their way to the front. And the invitation this morning is quite simple. Do you know this God that I've just described? Do you know Him? Have you truly trusted in His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior? If not, here in a moment, I want to ask you to stand. And if you need to be saved, When we stand, I want you to walk up to one of these pastors and I want you to tell them that so they can pray for you. You come. Well, perhaps there's some other spiritual decision in your life that needs to be made in light of what you've heard. And you want to come and ask for prayer. Then please respond during this invitation and come and ask for prayer. Or maybe you just want to come and kneel down and offer up your own wonderful, exalted doxology. You don't have to say it any different than than the way Paul said it. 
maybe just bring your Bible up here with you and kneel down here at the altar and, you, and just read that scripture back to the Lord as your prayer to Him. Holy Father, we commit this time to you now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you begin to stand and come as the Lord leads?